today is the human nature of Christ. The reason I've titled it the human nature of Christ is because Christ, of course, was divine. He was the Son of God. Jesus on earth did things that no man could do. He read people's thoughts. He spake as never a man spake. People touched him and power would come out of him. He spoke as one in spirit with the words. He drew people into his presence. He was the son of God on earth. He never ceased to be divine. But this study is, fa- is focusing on his humanity. So if you'd like to join me in prayer before we begin. Gracious eternal Father in heaven, in Jesus' name we pray. And Lord, we thank thee for your Sabbath day. We thank thee for having brought us together. We thank thee for thy word, how it is truly a lamp unto our feet. And I pray, Father, that this afternoon thou will bless thy word and speak to us, teach us about thy Son. and the victory that he gained for each one of us and that he wants to impart to each one of us is how my prayer. And I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. This is a study, as most of you would know, in Adventism is a very controversial one. And there are basically two different views. Some brethren believe that Jesus took the nature of Adam before he fell. Others believe he took the fallen nature of of Adam after he sinned. More recently, there's been a third view I've come across. And that is that some brethren believe, yes, Jesus took our fallen nature. But because of the understanding of sin and the nature of man, the brethren believe that our nature is sin. Therefore, they cannot accept that Christ truly partook of our nature, otherwise he would have been born a sinner. And so they end up forming a type of a hybrid Christ. A little bit of Adam before he fell and a little bit after he fell as well. They conclude that in the, in the body he was like us, fallen, that he tired, he hungered, he thirsted, he wearied, he grew older. But his mind was different. His mind was divine. Now that misunderstanding, I'm not saying this mind was not the one. But the reason they say this is because they understand that the human nature is sin. So Christ cannot partake of sin, otherwise he'd be born a sinner. So they have to split his nature into two. These are the things we're going to examine today. This study, I'm not sure whether we'll get through it, there's probably it's about 68 slides, it's maybe an hour and a half. I'd like to finish it, but it depends on, on you folk. But one thing I want to appeal to you, if we don't finish it or if you have to leave before it's finished, don't make a decision because it's only at the end where it comes together. If you miss the end, you won't understand it halfway through. It's very important. Because this is a topic that, that can seem contradictory at times. When we talk about temptations, when we talk about passions or propensities, people might be thinking, well, what's Bill saying? Am I saying that Christ lusted after women and things like that? Of course not. He was ever pure and undefiled. I want to make this perfectly clear. But he experiences the very weaknesses that every human being does. He had to in order to conquer those weaknesses and be able to impart that victory to us. I want you to think for a moment. If Jesus had a different nature, if his mind was not subject to temptation or if not subject to the weaknesses that we have, How can he be your example? How can you look to him in faith that he can impart to you the victories that you need over temptation when he didn't have to go through those same temptations because he didn't experience the same weaknesses or tendencies that we have? This is very important to to consider. For example, notice what Christ says in Revelation 3. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne Notice the next few words. 
even as I also overcame. Christ is saying to the one who overcomes, there's a reward. They said, I'm joined here with Christ, but then he compares it to how he also himself overcame. This word overcame, friends, it means to conquer, to subdue, to prevail against. What was it that Jesus had to conquer and subdue? What was it that he had to prevail against in his nature? If I was to ask you what is the greatest enemy that we face in our struggle in this world, we're told that the warfare against self is the greatest battle that was ever fought. This, this point here is the central, most important principle in this whole study, the war against self. We're going to see that this was Christ's greatest battle. That's why he says, to him who overcame, overcome if even as I also overcame. He had the war against self. Because in his nature, in his sinful fallen nature, self wanted to prevail. We're going to see that very clearly today. The warfare against self is the greatest battle that was ever fought. The yielding of self, surrendering all to the will of God, requires a struggle. But the soul must submit to God before it can be renewed in holiness. This is how Christ had to overcome, friends. Particularly what we see when we study in Gethsemane. It all climaxed in Gethsemane when he said, not my will, not myself, but your will be done. The Bible and the spirit of prophecy clearly teach that Jesus had to overcome self, which means he had to overcome the weaknesses and the sinful tendencies to which every man is subject. He is truly your example. This was the very heart of the message of 1888. Brother Wagoner here in his book, Christ and His Righteousness, Notice what he comments on. We're going to end with a statement from this book as well. And he really, he really brings it together at the end. But notice what he says here. Moreover, the fact that Christ took upon himself the flesh, not of a sinless being, but of sinful man, that is, that the flesh he assumed had all the weaknesses and sinful tendencies to which human nature is subject. Does it seem to you like all the wagoner here is making Christ different to us? He assumed all the weaknesses and sinful tendencies to which fallen human nature is subject. And of course, friends, that's biblical. It is shown by the statement that he was made of the seed of David, according to the flesh. What does according to the flesh mean, that he was different? The Bible goes out of its way, some of these passages we'll look at today. So plain to make you understand so you know clearly that he took your flesh and he had your weaknesses and the same tendencies brother he says sinful tendencies does inspiration support what all the wagoners said here we know that sister white clearly supported the, the message of 1888 first selected messages page 95 the son of god in his humanity wrestled with the very same fierce, apparently overwhelming temptations that assail men. Temptations to indulgence of appetite, to presumptuous venturing where God has not led them, and to the worship of the God of this world, to sacrifice an eternity of bliss for the fascinating pleasures of this life. Christ was tempted with these things, friends. He was tempted with the things of this world, fascinating pleasures. He was tempted to deny his allegiance to his father and worship the God of this world. He was tempted with appetite, with presumption. The very same fierce, apparently overwhelming temptations that we face. That's why he says, to him who overcometh, even as I also overcame. Indulgence of appetite, presumptuous venturing where God has not led, worship the God of this world. Are these sinful tendencies? These are the weaknesses of humanity. Inspiration just told us here that he wrestled with these very same temptations. Overwhelming at times. Christ had sinful tendencies, friends, and he had the war against them. He was not exempt from these weaknesses. He was made like unto his brethren with the same accessibilities, mental and physical, 
He was tempted in all points, like as we are, yet without sin. That word sensibility is there. It means influences, the same influences, the same predisposition to sin. He was tempted in that same way, both mentally and physically. Look at the verse she's quoting, Hebrews 4.15. That's what she's quoting from. We have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. He was in all points tempted like as we are. I want you to keep noticing with me how plain these statements are. Tempted in all points like as yet, like as, as we are. You know what this word infirmities means? That he's touched with, that he experienced? That's what it means, friends. It means the want of strength, weakness, infirmity of the body or the mind. You see, the brethren leave his mind out of it. They say, yes, in the body, yes, he tired, yes, he hungered. He had our weaknesses, but not the mind. The mind was separate. Friend, when the Bible says he was touched with the feelings of our infirmities, tempted in all points like as we are, it means particularly the mind. That's where the battle was. We're going to see that very plainly. And that's what this word means. Weakness of the body or the mind, weakness and frailty, etc. Notice this statement. The reason he can suckle those who are tempted, the reason why he can, he's touched with the feeling of our infirmities and be a faithful high priest is because he knows how strong are the inclinations of the natural heart. What do you think it means when it says the natural heart? There? Do you think it's talking about the spiritual nature or this flesh? It's the flesh, the natural heart. The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. It's talking about the flesh, friends. The fallen nature of Jesus. He knows how strong the inclinations in that fallen nature is. And he will be able to help in every time of temptation because he's experienced it and he's conquered it. Is that what Brother Wagner had said there? He assumed that all the weaknesses and the sinful tendencies which fallen man is subject. Christ experienced the very same ones. He knows how strong these inclinations are because he's experienced them. He knows by experience what are the weaknesses of humanity, what are our wants, and where lies the strength of our temptations. For he was in all points tempted like as we are. Notice these passages. He's experienced. He's wrestled with. That's what the scripture declares this. Hebrews 4.15, we just quoted in that previous passage. We have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin my friends the Bible says that Jesus was made of the seed of David he received from his humanity through Mary through his ancestors the same weaknesses that we receive and inherit he had to wrestle against these ones these things these tendencies and the Bible says he was made according to the flesh that's what it means that word flesh, everywhere this word is used in the book of Romans, Romans, by one extent, is what it means. The word is sarx. It means fallen human nature. It means the carnal nature. It means with all its frailties, physically and morally, its passions. This word is used for Jesus over and over again. Romans 8, 3. God sent his son in the likeness of sinful flesh. The word is sarx. It's the same word in, in here, Romans 1, 3 made according to the flesh. According to fallen nature, friends, with all its weaknesses. It's the same word in Hebrews 2, 15. For as children are partakers of flesh and blood, sarks, he also himself likewise took part of the same. Notice this passage. How similar was it? They may be wayward, talking about children here, they may be wayward, wayward children, and possess passions like those of humanity. But this should not defer us from bringing them to Christ. He blessed children that were possessed of passions like his own. In all these statements, inspired statements, Bible verses, never do you see where they're trying to make him different, particularly his mind, particularly in his war against temptation, against the passions of humanity, the weaknesses 
over and over again you see that he's truly our example that he wrestled with these things he's experienced these things he knows how strong is the experiences of the natural heart etc the Bible says that Christ possessed these passions same weaknesses and tendencies that we do and where were these passions where are they centred people say oh it's only in the body every passage we've looked at so far they all centred on the mind Christ wrestled with fierce overwhelming temptations that's in the mind friends he was tempted with indulgence of appetite that decision is always made in the mind presumption worship the God of this world the same weaknesses as mental and physical touch with the feelings of our infirmities body and mind he knows how strong are the inclinations of the natural heart he knows by experience the weakness of humanity and he blessed wayward children with passions like his own every one of those is centered in the mind so how can we leave his mind out of the equation how can we say his mind was different to us when that we're seeing over and over again is where the battle was he didn't just take the bodily form friends notice this statement it was in the order of God that Christ should take upon himself the form that's what you see and what else the nature of fallen man if the nature of fallen man is sin therefore you're born a sinner because this is what is being taught today you're born a sinner because your nature is sin inspiration is saying here that Christ took the nature of fallen man nor can you leave his mind out of it because of what we just saw previously it means that his mind also had the weakness of fallen humanity of fallen nature the reason brethren teach today that your nature is sin for example here this is Jack Sequera a book entitled Beyond Belief this statement here is the very epitome of Roman Catholic teaching this is the very epitome of the Antichrist teaching on sin the human nature itself is sin this is what they understand you see therefore Christ did not really partake of human nature otherwise he's a sinner that's why they changed his nature but what have we seen already so far our weaknesses our passions the inclinations of the natural heart wrestled with fierce almost overwhelming temptations indulgence of appetite etc Christ took your nature friends we just saw it here he took the form and the nature of fallen man you don't need to change Christ's nature nor do you need to bring in contradictions you see what you have to conclude if you believe your nature is sin therefore you have to change the nature of Christ what you're doing is just a, a more subtle form of the Immaculate Conception the Immaculate Conception was invented to cut Christ off from receiving inheritance through his human gene genealogy because they understand that when you're born you're a sinner human nature is sin and so they invented the Immaculate Conception where, just, where Mary never sinned therefore Christ seed is the Holy Ghost the mother she was immaculate so they've changed his nature when you're teaching when you leave his mind out of when in some way you were trying to change him from us it's the same thing you're trying to cut off his ancestry you're trying to cut off what he inherited we're going to see today friends as we've seen already to some degree that he had all the weaknesses that we possess and that was the very thing that he had to overcome see degraded and fallen humanity is not sin notice this think of Christ's humiliation he took upon himself fallen suffering humanity look how she describes it suffering human nature degraded and defiled by sin that's what he took upon himself the brethren teach you that that is sin he took that upon himself he was born with that every moment of his life he had to deal with that you're going to see at the end of this study I can't wait to get to how he conquered the Bible says he was made in the nature in the likeness of sinful flesh friends the 1888 message says the same thing 
Moreover, the fact that Christ took, not upon him, took upon himself the flesh, not of a sinless being, but of sinful man. Spirit of prophecy, Elder Wagon at the Bible, all perfect harmony. When you do these studies, you've got to have harmony. You can't have contradictions. If I have one contradiction, I can't rest, I will not speak upon it until I can answer that contradiction. Everything has to fit. He took upon himself sinful nature. Why can I just said here? He took not the flesh of sinless being, but of sinful man. The Spirit of prophecy says he took upon him our sinful nature. It seems very clear. No, notice how low, how low he, he went, how low he tread, tried in what he received from his ancestors. The Tsar of Ages. For 4,000 years, the race had been decreasing in physical strength in mental power and in what else? Moral worth. And Christ took upon him the infirmities of degenerate humanity. Now notice why. This is so important. Only thus could he rescue man from the lowest depths of degradation. You see, friends, if he's going to rescue man from the degenerate state he is in, he has to partake of that state and conquer it and impart the victory to that man so he can lift him up to his own spotless purity. The ladder didn't just reach the earth. Adam was unfallen. Adam was a human being. It reached far deeper than that. The humanity of Christ reached to the very depths of human wretchedness and identified itself with the weaknesses and necessities of fallen man. Again, if a man's nature is sin, we're born sinners, then how could Christ have partaken of this nature? So all you see over and over again that he took upon himself the form and nature of man, fallen man. He took upon himself fallen, suffering humanity, a nature that's degraded and defiled by sin. Christ took upon himself the flesh not of a sinless being, but of sinful man. He took on him our sinful nature. He took upon him the infirmities of degenerate humanity. His humanity identified itself with all the weaknesses and the necessities of fallen man. If you believe we're born sinners, you cannot harmonize these statements. It's impossible. Nor can you try to apply these statements to the physical body because we saw earlier they predominantly apply to the mind. Notice what scripture says. Hebrews 2, 14 to 16. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, what sort of flesh do children partake of? Fallen, sinful flesh. He also himself, likewise, I think God's trying to tell us something, took part of the same. And just to make sure you can't possibly get it wrong, for verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Wherefore, in all things, it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren. Why do people today are trying so desperately to change his nature when all we see over and over again? Seed of David according to the flesh. He came in the likeness of sinful flesh. As children are, are born of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same. In all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren. That word behooved, it means he was obligated. If he was going to come to save fallen man, he had to come like fallen man. He was obligated. And this is mortal man speaking. And yet that was... He's, he's declaring exactly how Christ had to come. Yet, friends, having said all of this, I don't want you to think that we're in some way degrading Christ. Notice this statement. In him was no guile or sinfulness. He was ever pure and undefiled. It's a beautiful statement. Yet he took upon him our sinful nature. Can you see how they go together? Yes, he took upon him our sinful nature, yet he was always pure and undefiled because sinful nature is not sin. You're not condemned because you have a sinful nature. He was born with a sinful nature, yet he was always pure and undefiled. Perfect harmony. You get no contradictions anywhere. The son does not bear the iniquity of the father. Sin is not impure where there is no law. Just the white understood. 
you remain pure and undefiled, although you possess a sinful nature like us. At this point, I'd like to bring in just a caution. A.T. Jones is one of my favourite pioneers. I'd love to study his, his uh, writings, particularly on this topic. But sometimes brethren can go a little too far, and I want to bring that out here because as I'm bringing out these statements, I don't want you, to, as I said earlier, I don't want people to think that I'm saying that Christ experienced the same evil thoughts, etc., that we do. I'm not saying that at all. This is what I'm saying. He was ever pure and undefiled. But he experienced, we're going to see how he experienced these things and how he conquered them. Brother A.T. Jones, speaking on the nature of Christ, this is what he wrote once. This is not one of his better statements. Then Satan took Jesus upon an exceeding high mountain <coughs> and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. This, of course, is the wilderness. The glory, the honor, the dignity. He showed him all that. And there, notice now, and there was at that moment, there was stirred up, talking about Jesus, as he looks upon these kingdoms. Prophet A.T. Jones says that there was at that moment stirred up in Jesus all the ambition that ever appeared in Napoleon, Caesar, or Alexander, or all of them put together. But from Jesus still the answer is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. This is where people go too far with the nature of Christ. You see, uh, E.T. Jones was a very good historian. He mentions here the three greatest generals, I believe, that ever lived. These men were truly men of ambition. They were very violent men. They were men who did not think twice about uh, killing and destroying in order to conquer and conquest. Most ambitious men that ever lived. You don't put Christ next to people like this and say that in him stirs up the same ambition of these wicked people. This is where you need to be careful. Even someone like A.T. Jones, as gifted as he was, so this is why I want to bring this out. And in this next segment, friends, now it gets very interesting. Come with me to Romans chapter 8 and verse 3. This passage here, Romans 8, 3, we're going to spend some time here. The Lord has shown me some things here <clears throat> that have brought me so much joy. And I, I pray that you'll experience the same. <coughs> Excuse me. This law, I believe, is this verse is the most powerful verse in all the Bible to teach you upon the nature of Christ. Before we read it, before we do a little study on Romans 8, 3, particularly a few verses in Romans 7, I want to bring out something about the law. Because we're going to look at this word law in Romans 7 and 8. When we talk about a law, we're talking about a rule or a regulation. <clears throat> you have civil laws, natural laws, health laws, laws of physics. One thing they all have in common is that they're absolute. They're non-negotiable. Thank you. They're binding upon us. I mean, you can disagree with them, you can break them, but there's penalties imposed, there's consequences. You may not like a health law. A health, one health law is we need to drink water. You may disagree with it. Stop drinking water for enough time and you'll dehydrate, eventually you'll die. The law is the law. You can't fight it. You may not like a road law. You go whatever speed you want. You get caught, there's a penalty. You may disagree with the law of gravity. Step off a high mountain, what's going to happen? They're binding. They're absolute and non-negotiable. When the Bible uses the word law, Take careful attention to what Paul is bringing out here. We're governed by laws every moment of our life. From the moment you wake in the morning, you get in your car, you obey laws on the road, there's laws at work when you come home, etc. There's laws in the home, your wife might have certain laws in the house. But laws are part of our life. When it, something is called a law, it has an authority and they're enforced. You break a civil law, they're enforced by the state, there's penalties imposed. Same thing with health laws, as we saw with water. What I'm saying about law is, friends, it governs, it has control of your life. The law of gravity governs your actions. The law of the road governs how you drive. Laws of, of health govern 
how you eat and drink, etc., how you live. And the law of God, of course, covers every as- governs every aspect of our lives. You have no say in these laws. They impact on your life whether you like them or not. Please understand this principle now. This is so crucial about the nature of Christ, to understand this principle and how he came. These laws demand a response from us, every one of us. And depending upon your response to these laws, there's repercussions, good or bad. For example, you have two citizens. There's a law in a state which, which forbids robbery or stealing. One man steals. He gets caught, he breaks the law. He's condemned, he's penalised and he's labelled as a thief. He has a bad reputation in society. You have another man. He obeys that law. He lives an honest life. He's respected in society and he's he's looked upon as an an upstanding citizen in in society. And so you can see how that law, how they responded to it, impacted upon their character, both personally and how people look upon them. One became a thief, one becomes an honest person. The characters and the penalty or reward or recognition they receive is dependent upon how they respond to the law. It could be a bad law, an inhumane one, where once again it may violate against your conscience. Nonetheless, the way you respond to it will impact upon your character. It will also impact upon others as well. What has this to do with the nature of Christ? Come to Romans 7 and verse 19. Paul is speaking. He says, For the good that I would not, that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. He wants to do good, he has a desire to do good. And the evil that he doesn't want to do, that's what he's doing. So what's controlling? The evil. Let's read verse 20 now. Now if I do that, I would not. It is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. So now that evil that he, he mentioned in the previous verse, he calls it sin. He said, the reason I can't do good is because an evil is with me. And that's that sin that dwells in me. Now look what he calls that sin that dwells in him. That is the controlling power. Look what he calls it. Verse 21. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. He calls this sin that dwells in him a law. It's in his nature. And he calls it a law. It's preventing him from doing good. Now remember, it's how you respond to a law that results in your actions and therefore your character. Notice what he says now, verse 22. This is a beautiful verse. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. What he says now is, in, is important. He's, this is an unconverted man speaking. He's a man who's struggling with sin. He can't overcome it. He says, evil is present with me. I want to do good, but I only do evil. And it's a sin that dwells, it's this law of sin that's dwelling in me. He says, I delight after the law of God. Where? Where is it? In the inward man. It's in his mind. This is a sinner speaking, an unconverted man. But he says that in his mind there's a knowledge to do good. There's a desire to do good. There's an understanding of good, of moral, of moral virtue. And that's what he wants to do. But the law of sin is holding him captive. How many laws have we read about now? We've read about the law of sin. And we've read about, verse 22, the law of God. Where's the law of God? It's in his mind. The Bible's saying it. In the inward man, that means in my inner being, some translations say the law of God is in, is in him. It's in every man, by the way. He says, I delight in the law of God after the inward man. My inner being delights in the law of God. Look what happens now. Verse 23. Although he delights, although he wants to do good, follow his conscience, follow God's leading. But he says, I see another law in my members. Look what it's doing. It's warring against the law of my mind. See the battle that's going on? You want to see this with Jesus? There's this battle going on in his mind. 
The law of God is there. It's demanding a response. He wants to bring out glory and virtue by the law and his members. There's another law that it's warring. Look which one's winning. Warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. The law of sin is controlling, friends. The law in the flesh is controlling him. It's bringing him captivity. What are the wages of sin? Death. Look what he says now, verse 24. He realizes his condition. Look what he says. A wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? He realizes if he keeps going the way he is, he's got a death sentence over his head. But now something happens. There's this struggle going on. The law of God, the law of sin, but he's held captive to the law of sin. He calls it the body of this death. He doesn't see any hope. But then something happens. His conversion happens. Now let's read verse 25. He's no longer in captivity. You see, he found this higher law and he started to respond to it. Look what the result is. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, with the mind I myself serve the law of God. Which one's controlling now? It's the law of God. He thanks God. Now he's got deliverance. Now he's free. His mind is served. What's it mean to serve? It means to obey. He's obeying the law of God. What happened to the law of sin? Did it disappear? What does it say? But with the flesh, the law of sin, they're both still there. They were there before he was converted. They're still there now after he's converted. They were both part of his nature. But now he's responded to the higher power that God placed in him, by the way. And he's experiencing victory. He's delighting now. The death sentence is removed. Look what he says now. The very next verse. Don't take note of the chapter so much. This is a continuing this, uh, argument he's making here. He had this death sentence over him. Now he's delivered. He's thanking God. He's serving God with his mind, his law. He's obeying it. And now he says, Now therefore there is no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. Why? Who walk after the flesh. Who walk after the spirit and not after the flesh. Thank you. See what made the difference? He started to walk or obey the law of his mind that God placed there. He started to walk after the spirit and deny the flesh that was previously warring and holding him captive. Both the laws are there, friends. It's which one we respond to that, that dictates to our character, and etc. To, to be in Christ Jesus means to walk after the Spirit. And to walk means to serve. They're actions of the will. To walk, to serve, these are all actions of the will. And they're your response to either of these two laws. What I want you to notice with me is that in this man's nature, in every man's nature, there are two laws operating. There's the law of sin and there's the law of the spirit. You're not a sinner because the law of sin is in your flesh. Because here in verse 25, Paul's delivered. He's converted. He's thanking God. But the law of sin is still in his flesh. That's why when the brethren teach that you're a sinner because of your sinful nature, they haven't understood this principle. It's all the way through the Bible. It's everywhere. Your nature does not change after conversion. It only changes it the second coming, you still have to contend with that law of sin. But it's like the, it's like the, the evil man and his deeds. It's been, it's been crucified. It doesn't rise up anymore. Your mind now serves the higher power which God placed there from the beginning. It's part of your nature. The law of sin is still in his flesh, but he's not serving it. This is exactly how Jesus came into this world. We're going to see it now in the next verse. Oh, I just want to repeat Romans 7.25. The Apostle Paul is rejoicing in Christ. He's converted. He thanks God. He says, with my mind I serve the, the law of God, with the flesh the law of sin. Paul is no longer a sinner at this point. So the law of sin, although it's there, it's not being responded to. So it's not a sin. Notice this. The animal part, that's the law of sin. The animal part of our nature should never be left to govern the moral and intellectual. You see, friends, there's two powers working in mankind. And by the way, you're endowed with these things. 
they're there from birth. God places them there from birth. They're endowed with moral powers, higher and nobler powers. And the animal part, that's the lower nature, the law of sin, it should never be left to govern. This is what Paul discovered. That's when he started to experience victory. Jesus came into the world like this. You're going to see it now. But he never responded to that, and he killed it. He, he crucified it, all right. He conquered it. Now, when you say that in Christ was the law of sin, people think, oh, well, what are you saying? I'm going to show you exactly what the Bible's saying. I'm not saying it. The law of sin has dwelt in every man since Adam fell. Every man. And it has held every man captive. Even men like Moses and Paul who are speaking here. It's the consequence we receive from Adam. Partaking of the free of knowledge of good and evil. He passes that on to us. And friends, Jesus is called the son of David, as we saw earlier. The Gospels record his genealogy all the way through his ancestors. And when the Bible says that he is born according to the flesh, that's exactly what it means. And so he was subject to the law of sin like every other man. The only way that Christ could free humanity from this law that has held everybody captive was to come as one of us to be made subject to this same law and then, but never respond to it and therefore he would condemn this law in his flesh. Let's read Romans 8 verse 2 now. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Once again you see both the laws there. And as we saw earlier, the laws are non-negotiable principles. That's whether we like them or not, they're there, they're part of our nature. We have to respond to them. And the apostle here is responding to the law of God and he says that the spirit of life in Christ, or the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, made him free from the law of sin and death that he was previously in bondage to. By the way, which is the more powerful now? The law of the spirit. Before he was held in captivity by the law of sin. But the law of sin was never more powerful. It was his will that was giving into it. The will is the governing power in the life. Christ had a free will. He never exercised his will toward, toward self. This is why he was able to conquer this this principle. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus is the more powerful of the two. And it's called the law. If you come back to Romans 7.22 for a moment, you'll notice there what Paul says, I delight in the law of God after the inward man. That's the same law he's speaking about in Romans 8 too. It's not a different law. The law of God, the law of the spirit of Christ in Christ Jesus. Now he's responding to it. And it's, it's, it's converted him. It's changed him. The Bible says that Christ is the light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world. The grace of God that bringeth salvation have appeared unto all men, teaching them to un deny ungodliness and worldly lusts, to live soberly and righteously and godly in this present world. That's part of your nature. From the very beginning, as we're seeing here, these moral and intellectual powers, Christ speaking to us, helping us to do what is right, lighting us. You're not totally deprived, deprived and incapable of doing anything good. You remember this study last time when we studied Romans 2? This is saying exactly the same thing what we're just learning now in Romans 7. This is telling us that even Gentiles, even people who don't know God, have in their nature knowledge of God and knowledge of his law. Notice what it says. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by what? Nature. The things contained in the law. The things contained in the law, friends, is righteousness. To do righteousness. The Bible says that these are people that never know God, never heard of his law, and yet by nature, their nature, they do the things contained in God's law. They, they obey God, keep his commandments. Having not a law, a law, the law, a law unto themselves, Notice what it says now, which show, they prove, they prove the work of the law that it's written in their hearts. The Bible says that every man has God's law written. That's why Paul said, I delight after the law of God in the inward man. Because it was there, and it was speaking to him, it was convicting him, saying, this is the way, walk your unit. That's what this is saying, they prove the work of the law written in their hearts. Even people who don't know God. Their conscience also bears witness. This is why every mouth will be stopped. 
No one could say I didn't know. No one could say I didn't know right from wrong, regardless of whether you heard a minister or not, or ever had a Bible or anything. Your thoughts will accuse or excuse you in the day of the judgment. But the point is that they show God's law is written in their hearts. It's part of their nature. The law of the Spirit is part of your nature. It's that still small voice. It's the moral powers we are endowed with. It's even called a spark of God's own life. Remember this? We saw last time. This is saying the same thing. Your nature is not sin. What was the inspiration? It says the nature of man is threefold. It comprehends physical, intellectual and moral powers. That's why those Gentiles who don't know God or don't know his law do the things contained in the law. In other words, they, they live moral lives because they're endowed with moral powers, friends. It's part of their human nature. What are those moral powers? First Corinthians 13. Faith, hope and love. Inspiration says this is part of the human being's nature, a fallen human being. Faith, hope and love. Moral powers that speak to them. <laughs> And these powers are supposed to dominate. It's not true that you come into the world to captive to the devil. This, this is the blasphemy of the worst kind. Nothing is. Watch the previous presentation uh, that we did on this and you'll see that very clearly. Notice this statement. These moral powers, faith, hope and love, any mother will know this, any parent would know this. In some children, these powers actually strongly predominate. They have power of will to control their minds and actions. Beautiful, very encouraging these that's why Paul delighted after the law of God, after the inward man. And was waiting for him to respond. It's always striving with us, seeking to lead us in the way of righteousness. It speaks to our conscience. Every noble deed, every right motive, whenever you ponder the eternal things, when you feel guilty, these emotions, these thoughts, it's the law of the spirit, friends, that's fighting for you against the law of sin it's in your members. It's that war that's going on for every human being. God has given us a free will and he's, that we may respond to this law that he's placed in every man. Look at this beautiful statement. Every faculty that we possess has been provided for us in Christ. For when God gave his son to our will, he included all heaven in this gift. And God would have men value their powers as a sacred gift from him. A spark of God's own life has been breathed into the human body, making him, man, a living soul, the possessor of what? Moral endowments and the will to direct his own course of action. You have opportunity, friends, when you come into this world. Even if we don't have the blessing of having faithful parents, God is your Father. He speaks to you. His law is written in your heart and he's trying to call you. A spark of his own life is in every person and you have moral endowments. You can exercise this free will and respond to his law and it will empower you. You'll become a child, a children of honour. Look at this beautiful statement. Those who train their pupils to feel that power lies in themselves. We're to teach our children, we're to teach our students, our pupils, that they have a power in... This is not new age, friends, this is spirit of prophecy. They have a power in themselves. To what? Become men and women of honour and usefulness and will be most permanently successful. The reason she can say that is because of what we read here. You're a possessor of moral endowments. You have faith, hope and love which will transform your life. And we're to tell people they have these things. It's encouraging. It's not from them. It's from God. It's a gift. That's what it says here. It's a gift from men. He included all heaven in his gift. And he would have men value the powers as a sacred gift. So I'm not saying it's from men. But nonetheless, we're to encourage people with these beautiful truths. And they can become men and women of honour and be the most successful. You don't have to be subject to the law of sin because man has conquered it. Now we're going to look at Romans 8 3. Come with me to Romans 8 3. Paul now closes his argument on this little segment here where he was first struggling, then he receives uh, deliverance, he delights and he thanks God. He says, I'm walking after the spirit of life now. And look what he says. This is why it all happened. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. We're going to really look at this text now. 
the first part he says, for what the law could not do because it was weak through the flesh. Why was the law weak through the flesh? What was the problem? Because no man in sinful flesh has ever been able to keep the law. All the time, that is. The law only, you don't have to break the law once, you're a sinner and you're condemned. No man in history had ever been able to keep the law. And so the law was weak through the flesh. It was always being defeated by the law of sin. The law of sin was always conquering. Remember Romans 7, 22 and 23 where he says, I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, bringing me into captivity to the law of sin. That's what was happening right throughout history until Jesus came. What does the law produce? What does it want to produce that it was weak for the flesh? Romans 8, 4. The, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled. The law wants to produce righteousness. But it wasn't happening. Romans 8, 3, it says it was weak for the flesh. So Paul is saying up until Jesus came on the earth, the law was weak for the flesh. It was never able to produce any righteousness. Why? Because the law of sin would always have dominion. So what is it that has to be conquered in order that the law can produce righteousness. What's got to be conquered? The law of sin. Follow me now. The law of sin has held every man captive. It's in every man's nature. No man's been able to defeat it. No man can produce righteousness. Every man is condemned before God. So God sends his son with different flesh to you without the law of sin in his, in his nature. What's that going to achieve? It'll achieve what, Satan's, what Satan will say. No man can keep your law. They're my captives. God has to send his son exactly like every other human being was subject to that same law and never once submit to it. Then it can be conquered and that's exactly what this text is saying. That's the only thing God can do. This is my comment, it's not inspired. He must send his son to this earth as a human being subject to the law of sin in his nature. This is going to blow away this point in this thing like you've never seen before. This is everything, friends. He has to send his son this way. He has to be subject to the law of sin in his nature. They say that is sin. That's the consequence of sin, by the way. And he has to conquer that law every moment of his life. And that's exactly what Romans 8, 3 says. It's exactly what it's saying. What the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh was every man had failed. Because of the law of sin. God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. The same flesh. That word is sax, by the way. And for sin, for a sacrifice for sin, he condemns sin in that flesh. That's exactly what the verse is saying. And he had, no, he had, it had to be done that way. Remember this statement from Brother Wagner? The flesh which he had assumed had all the weaknesses and sinful tendencies to which fallen human nature is subject. He's actually quoting on Romans 8, 3 when he says that. That's why we saw all these inspired statements earlier. The Son of God wrestled with the very same fierce, overwhelming temptations, indulgence to appetite, presumption, worship of the God of this world, the same susceptibilities of mental and physical. He knows how strong the inclinations of the natural heart. He knows by experience what are the weaknesses of humanity. He blessed children with passions like his own. He took the form and nature of man. He took upon him our sinful nature. He took upon himself fallen, suffering human nature, degraded and defiled. Christ took upon him the infirmities of degenerate humanity. The humanity of Christ reached to the very depths of human wretchedness and identified itself with the weaknesses and necessities of fallen man. That's what Romans 8.3 is saying, friends. God sent his son in the likeness of sinful flesh. That's what all these statements are saying. They all harmonize perfectly. We don't have to believe in the Immaculate Conception or in the hereditary chain being broken somewhere along the way. We don't have to believe that Christ's humanity was different to ours. He came subject to the law of sin in his flesh. We believe what God's word declares. It says he was made with the suit of David according to the flesh. It says as children partake of the flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same. It says he took the suit of Abraham and that he came in the likeness of sinful flesh. And once again, I want to repeat, don't think we're in any way depreciating Christ's character here. There should be no, not the faintest misgivings in regard to the perfect freedom from sinfulness 
in the human nature of Christ. Because you see, sinful nature is not sin. You don't have to change his nature. He was subject to the law of sin, but he never responded to it. It had no impact upon his character. That's why she can say this. In him was no guile or sinfulness. He was ever pure and undefiled, yet he took upon him our sinful nature. He never responded to it, friends. And it never touched his character. 